We like the products of the free market, the wealth, the choices, the goods and the services that previous generations could not have dreamt of. But we're not as willing to accept the workings of the free market, the seemingly chaotic ups and downs, the fact that it produces both winners and losers. So we give the government power to deal with these problems. Listen to these words from 1980. Don't they still ring true today? Every time I come to Washington, I am impressed all over again with how much power is concentrated in this city. But we must understand the character of that power. It is not monolithic power in a few hands, the way it is in countries like the Soviet Union or Red China. It is fragmented into lots of little bits and pieces with every special group around the country trying to get its hand on whatever bits and pieces it can. The result is that there's hardly an issue in which you won't find government on both sides. For example, in one of these massive buildings scattered all through this town, filled to the bursting with government employees, some of them are sitting around trying to figure out how to spend our money to discourage us from smoking cigarettes. In another of the massive buildings, maybe far away from the first, some other employees, equally dedicated, equally hardworking, are sitting around figuring out how to spend our money to subsidize farmers to grow more tobacco. Well, it's obvious that things haven't changed much. US politicians still spend tax dollars on anti-smoking campaigns, and tobacco farming is still subsidized by the government. Each of these programs spends money taken from our pockets that we could be using to buy goods and services to meet our separate needs. All of these programs use very able, very skilled people who could be doing productive things. Once you've created a special interest group, it's difficult to uncreate it. Every so often, a bill is introduced to Congress to eliminate tobacco subsidies, and routinely they're voted down. Who knows, maybe one day one will pass. In the economic market, people who intend to serve only their own private interests are led by an invisible hand to serve public interests that it was no part of their intention to promote. In the political market, there's an invisible hand operating as well, but unfortunately, it operates in the opposite direction. People who intend only to serve the public interest are led by an invisible hand to serve private interests that it was no part of their intention to promote. It's not that people in government aren't well-intentioned. These are not evil people purposely trying to wrest away our freedoms. It's just the nature of the job. The deals made here affect all of us, and sometimes in ways we don't like. But don't blame the people making the deals. They're just pursuing their own self-interest, which may be as narrow as making a buck or as broad as trying to reform the world. Friedman worried that people would stop doing what they and others they deal with thought was best. And instead, they would be doing what the government encouraged or required through regulation, taxes and tax loopholes. And that creates new problems. Taxation to help the poor might result in less growth and so less poverty reduction. And bans on abortion may mean that abortion takes place anyway, but becomes less safe. Tighter border controls might force immigrants to stay in the US once they manage to get in, rather than risk going back when the economy retracts and there are fewer employment opportunities. Every government intervention results in unintended consequences. These consequences have to be dealt with as well, and that leads to new unintended consequences. The result is a constant growth of government. In 1980, Friedman designed a very graphic way to highlight this problem. The federal regulations that govern our lives are available in many places. One set is here, in the Library of Congress, in Washington, D.C. In 1936, the federal government established the Federal Register to record all of the regulations, hearings, and other matters connected with the agencies in Washington. This is volume one, number one. In 1936, it took three volumes like this to record all these matters. In 1937, it took four, and then it grew and grew and grew. At first, rather slowly and gradually, 
But even so, year by year, it took a bigger and bigger pile to hold all the regulations and hearings for that year. Then around 1970 came a veritable explosion so that one pile is no longer enough to hold the regulations for that year. It takes two and then three piles until on one day in 1977, September 28th, the Federal Register had no fewer than 1,754 pages. And these aren't exactly what you would call small pages either. It wasn't always like this. America was founded with something different in mind. Milton Friedman came here to Philadelphia, an Independence Hall, to reflect on the founding fathers. Almost 200 years ago, a remarkable group of men gathered in this room to write a constitution for the new nation that they had helped to create a few years earlier. They were a wise and learned group of people. They had learned the lesson of history. The great danger to freedom is a concentration of power, especially in the hands of a government. They were determined to protect the citizens of the new United States of America from that danger. And they crafted their constitution with that in mind. That constitution has served us well. It has enabled us to preserve our freedom for close on to 200 years. But in the past 50 years, we have been forgetting the lesson that the wise men knew so well. From regarding government as a threat to our freedom, we have come more and more to regard government as a benefactor from which all good things flow. Friedman was afraid that a bigger government would threaten the incredible results of economic freedom. Because the economy is not a zero-sum game. In other words, we're not fighting over ever smaller pieces of the pie. The pie is constantly growing larger as people and businesses become more productive. And the world is getting wealthier all the time. In the last 100 years, with relatively free markets, we have created more wealth than in the 100,000 years before. And as a result, we have reduced extreme poverty around the world, more than people ever dreamed was possible. Americans and Swedes alike, we're all obsessed with our monthly paycheck. But how much that paycheck is really worth, to find out that is not as simple as it seems. What's the inflation rate? Do goods and services cost more or less today than they did last year? We have to look at what we can buy, how far that paycheck takes us. And that has increased dramatically because entrepreneurs become rich by constantly reducing the price of everything we want. Let's look at a couple of everyday items. 25 years ago, you had to work for 456 hours to be able to buy a cell phone. Today, after all the productivity increases that businesses and innovators have introduced, you only have to work for four hours. And of course, it's a better deal today. This is not just a phone. It also doubles as a texting device, a calendar, a camera, almost everything. In these same 25 years, the cost of a personal computer has been reduced from 435 hours to 25 hours. And you really couldn't compare it to those original PCs that wouldn't be able to run any of the software or the operating systems that we use today. What about a basic necessity like food? Well, we don't see the recent dramatic productivity increases that we see when we look at electronics. The great leap forward in agricultural technology happened 100 years ago. But with a long-term perspective, you certainly see a lot of change. In 1920, you had to work for 37 minutes to afford half a gallon of milk. Today, you wouldn't have to work more than seven minutes. And in 1920, it cost you two and a half hours to buy three pounds of chicken. Today, you'd get away with less than 14 minutes. Professor Friedman noticed something similar 30 years ago. Over a quarter of a century ago, I bought secondhand a desk calculator for which I paid $300. One of these little calculators today, which I can buy for $10 or so, will do everything that did and more beside. What produced this tremendous improvement in technology? 
Friedman's conclusion was that accepting differences of outcome does not just make the winners better off, but the losers as well. People with a lot of money can afford to be early adopters. They can pay ridiculous amounts for the first versions of cell phones and personal computers. And that's a good thing for us, because they create bigger markets so the companies get revenue, so that they can streamline production and create lower cost versions so that all of us can buy one. And historically, this seems to be the case. Free markets regularly turn luxuries into consumer goods. This may seem hard to believe, but the average rate of ownership for refrigerators, air conditioners and dishwashers is higher among poor American households today than they were for all American households in the early 1970s. When people are free, they are able to use their own resources most effectively and you have a great deal of productivity, a great deal of opportunity. The major beneficiaries are always a small man. The man who has power, who's at the top of a society, he's going to do well whatever kind of a society you have. It's the society which gives the small man the opportunity to go his way, which is going to benefit him the most.